Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Innovation Week uh, and to this particular bracket, which is on creating impact through health innovation. Uh, my name is Peter Chung. I'm the Associate uh, Dean of Innovation Enterprise for the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry, and Health Sciences. And uh, my erstwhile colleagues here up on stage will be part of a, a group presenting to you, and I'll introduce them uh, in a moment. Uh, can I just start by uh, acknowledgement to country? Uh, it, uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, we acknowledge the uh, traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting, uh, land of the Wurundjeri people, members of the Kulin Nation. And to all their elders, past, present, and emerging, we extend our respect and welcome. And for any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the audience today, welcome as well. So the, the area of innovation and enterprise is something the University of Melbourne is, is well known for. In the faculty, we do it every day in terms of what we do. We innovate, and occasionally we have a bit of enterprising thought and spirit behind that. But it's a new world, and it's changing, changing very quickly. So um, over the last year, we have more formally brought together uh, Innovation Enterprise team. And if I could use this opportunity to, to introduce them, we have Associate Professor Lauren Aiton. Lauren is the Director of uh, uh, Program Delivery and Industry Engagement for the INE team. She's a Principal Research Fellow in the Centre for Eye Research Australia and the Department of uh, the Department of uh, Optometry and Vision Sciences at the university. Her research interests are in retinal disease and emerging therapeutics, and she has previously worked in academia and industry on medical device development. Uh, Buzz Palmer. Buzz is uh, one of our enterprise professors. He's the CEO of the MedTech Actuator and Director of Program Design for the INE team. Uh, he's one of Australia's most prominent voices in health entrepreneurship and medical technology innovation. He has a background uh, both in orthopedic and regenerative medicine and has a proven track record across quite a number of continents in this area. I'll introduce uh, Kim and Olivia in a moment, uh, but just to say that um, nothing would, would happen without a really good logistic manager and our sword and our shield is Haley. Uh, at the back there, and, and Haley's responsible for, for all our successes in getting us uh, anywhere on time and making sure we do all the right things. Um, we don't run as just a group of four people dictating what should occur or not occur in innovation in our faculty, and in fact, we are informed by our steering committee who are representatives from each of the different schools. They've been selected by their the head of school as being people most engaged at this moment to lead and drive in this area. And with that group, we also have our early and mid-career representatives. So, so the mission of our group really is to create impact through innovation and enterprise. And, and that has been, I guess, the mandate sent down from, from the deanery that we should do as much innovating as we can. And if we can push it out in an enterprising way, that's how we make impact. If we just keep it in the closed room, tucked between the folders of a journal, it might not actually do much over time. So it's a very proactive process that we're engaged with. And for us, it's meant a, a bit of a journey to develop the mindset at all the different levels to think about what innovation means in, in each person's individual world and, and to see if we can really um, charge people within our faculty with the skill sets to do something about it. And finally, when they get to a certain stage where they have the mindset and the skill set and they're taking their research somewhere, is, is actually to provide them with the funds and the tools to actually deliver on that. So the purpose of today is really to explore the social and commercial elements of enterprise as seen through um, the field of health. You, you, if, if you're in law or, or, or in, in science, uh, in engineering, you, you would see it. You may see it differently. Um, we we have a very strong view that what we do commercially should also balance well with social enterprise. And the question is, you know, social enterprise not always commercial, but at the same time, there's the reality that if you don't make social enterprise sustainable, you won't have impact. So there is an element of how you deal with that as well. Uh, the most important thing to us and to every university is about its impact on society. And for us, it is perhaps the most important thing. 
as you will read in, in our strategic document available outside. So our participants today uh, are, are the four people you, s you see up front. Um, we have uh, Professor Kim Delzeal. Uh, Kim is the Professor and Head of the Health Economics Group and Deputy Director of the Centre for Health Policy in the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health. Uh, Kim leads a program of research in child health as well as having specific and specialist expertise in economic evaluation and modelling child health policy, vulnerability, equity and the use of health services and economic evaluation alongside clinical trials. Professor Olivia Carter. Um, Olivia is Professor of Psychology in the Melbourne School of Psychological Sciences and uh, Olivia's research work really focuses on the biological processes that underpin consciousness and the impact of neurotransmitters in complex brain function. Olivia's research includes understanding the impact that new uh, neuroscience discoveries, pharmacology and neurotechnology has on society. And for us in the faculty, she's also our impact lead and therefore makes the connection between what we all do as academics what we do on the innovation um, enterprise team, as well as pushing it outwards towards the university, and Olivia would represent us on that. So uh, without further ado, what I would like to do is introduce Kim uh, to, to speak about health innovation through the lens of policymakers. Thank you very much, and great to be here. Um, so one of, one of the roles that I play as a health economist is I think I'm involved in generating evidence alongside like clinical trials. So I understand kind of generating the evidence base that would be needed for new technologies um, and for new innovations. But I also, we um, hold a contract at the University of Melbourne where we evaluate new, um, new medical devices, technologies and for the Medical Services Advisory Committee, which is the committee that makes the decisions about what would be receiving item numbers for Medicare. And we also evaluate um, lots of the new medicines. Um, our group does assessments to see whether the, the government would like to fund those medicines under the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme or the PBS. So I guess I see policy, I see innovation coming through in a couple of different places, like at the evidence generation stage, which is a lot of that work would be happening in industry or in academic institutions, but then also what's happening around some of those policy making tables. And I get to see a little bit of what happens when they make that decision to say, yes, I'm gonna fund, we're going to fund this medical device or no, we're not. And what are the things that are mattering at that stage and, and on what basis are they making those decisions? So I think the first thing just to emphasise is that at some point, most innovations and technologies are going to come across a, a policy maker of some type, whether it's often it would be a funder and that there's going to be decisions made about the adoption of that, um, that innovation. So the ones that I'm most familiar with are kind of state government funders or um, federal government funders or perhaps private insurers. But I, I recognising that's my experience, there could be others as well. So just to think about the, the legitimacy of their perspective as a policymaker and I guess put ourselves in their shoes, what are they going to want to know about our innovations and technologies at the point they're making those decisions? Um, and who will actually fund our innovations and under what funding model or mechanism will they fund them? Um, and to think about that. So often this type of consideration is considered a fourth hurdle. So um, an example of that would be the pharmaceutical benefits scheme who are making these decisions. They, that what they use to make a decision about a new medicine or a new medical device for listing with Medicare is they want to know the safety of the um, technology. They want to know its effectiveness, its cost effectiveness, and also its budget impact. And then I've got another category called other because there's this little bit of a black box of other things that they also pull into their decisions. So if we firstly think about safety, effectiveness and cost effectiveness, they're all framed through the lens of what we call a, a PICO criteria. So PICO stands for patients, intervention, comparator and outcomes. 
And I've seen a few interesting things happen on each of these criteria. So the first one, patience. We, um, my colleague Adam, he sits on a committee where they review Medicare item numbers and they just had a technology come up the other week which was for genomic counselling. Um, no, sorry, not genomic counselling. It was a genomic testing. Uh, it was a particular type, um, which is not important to the detail. But when it made to the policy making table, they were asked to explain who who the patients were for this particular test, and the response was, "Well, it's for everyone. Everyone could get the test." <laughs> and they're like, "Well, that that wasn't good enough." So that technology kind of is stumbling at that stage because the, the policy makers want to know, well, exactly who, exactly how do they get through the door, how do they get to the technology, and just all patients was not good enough. They wanted to know, well, who, who has the greatest benefit from this test? Like, um, are there segments of the population that are at a greater likelihood of having a benefit? Um, the next one is I, so intervention, and I've seen a few interesting situations here too. The first innovation... So it's describing what is the parameters of that intervention. Um, the first one I saw is not a device or a medicine, but it was actually a new innovative model of care that the government wanted to evaluate, which was called medical care homes. And we were involved in, in some of that evaluation and it kind of failed spectacularly. And from an economics perspective, one of the reasons that it failed was the way the intervention was designed would never be cost effective because it was always des by design it was too expensive so the best possible outcome it could ever achieve even if it achieved that it still wouldn't have been cost effective by design so the intervention and the framing of the intervention is really important in terms of how it might satisfy a, a PICO criteria when it makes it to a decision maker one day the other example I had there was glucose monitoring devices. There was a particular device that we were working on and um, the same thing. By design, it was always going to be too expensive relative to the comparator for the market that it was headed to. Fortunately, for something like a glucose monitor, there are ways to reduce the price, which is um, if by modifying things like the frequency of the monitoring or the length of time that the person's wearing it or how frequently they're returning for visits. So in a technology like that, there was an opportunity to modify the intervention to get it at that sweet spot where it was going to be shown to be effective and cost effective. Um, C is for comparator. So that's usually usual care. But this can get really tricky because... And it's worth being aware of fairly early in the process what you might be up against as your comparator. So the pharmaceutical benefits scheme are really fussy about their comparator and you have to show effectiveness, safety and cost effectiveness relative to that comparator. And we see interventions coming through where at the very last hurdle they, they fall over because the comparator was still wrong. And... Um, the government doesn't have a good tolerability for there being another comparator out there that does the exact same thing, but that's cheaper. <laughs> so that's something just to keep an eye on. And we've seen quite a few that have come through and they're priced more expensively than a comparator. And the way that the, the innovators were looking at it was, well, we just won't nominate that as our comparator. And the government's not happy with that approach. If it exists as a comparator, it will get pulled in as a comparator, whether you would like to frame it as your comparator or not. Um, the next one, O, is for outcomes. And the things that I've seen in that space is when you get to this fourth hurdle, that very last decision by someone wanting to fund or adopt an innovation or technology, the things that they're going to value the most are outcomes that are relevant to the patients. So this are, these are often outcomes that are not thought about super early in the process that the patient relevant outcomes and we also see technologies fall over and not get funded because they're not able to demonstrate they may have an improvement in an in a t like more of a clinical or a technical outcome but it's not one that's of value to a patient so um, having patient relevant outcomes is super important there too um, so I guess in t when we get to this policy making stage there's a lot of expertise that gets put across the technology things like statisticians and clinical trialists, health economists, but also consumers. So you might not be aware, but the 
co-chair of the pharmaceutical benefits scheme is a consumer. So re when we get to that final stage, consumers are really heavily engaged in a lot of those decision-making processes. So I guess that makes us realise that engagement with these end users, I think I would think about that as consumers, but also the policymakers themselves is quite essential. Um, we had an example of that where we kind of got it wrong once, which was we thought we were looking at a paediatric innovation and we thought we knew we had to be patient relevant. So we made sure that we measured the quality of life of the children who would be affected. And then we got a few steps down the road and a consumer, our consumer advisory group pulled us up quite dramatically because we hadn't actually thought about measuring the quality of life of their carer. So that's an example where kind of consulting with the consumers themselves gave us something different to think about that we hadn't even thought about ourselves, even though we were trying to be patient relevant. Um, the other thing um, I would mention is other, I guess. So I, I talked about these, these decision policy makers I'm seeing make decisions. They look at safety, effectiveness, cost effectiveness, budget impact, and then I said other. So some of the other things I've seen considered are um, they're kind of, some of them are represented in what we call um, a value flower. So it's sort of like how we think about the value of a technology or an intervention. And they've got some things there that are also not very obvious or you might not think about straight away. So they're things like equity, um, how severe the disease is that's being treated by the innovation, um, the value of hope, um, spillovers, so impacts that are beyond the intended recipient of that um, technology, impacts on productivity, and how many other options might be available to the person receiving that technology um, if they weren't receiving the new innovation. So decision makers kind of bring those, kind, those sorts of other factors into their decision making as well, which I guess underpins even more so why we might want to engage with them and then gather some evidence around some of those things too. Um, the other thing that comes up with policymakers is the issue of risk sharing. So with, our, with the pharmaceutical decisions, what we're seeing at the moment is for some of the big budget items, drugs that are coming in with over $100 million bills per year, the government's quite adverse to themselves bearing the risk on their decisions. So they do things like risk sharing agreements where um, they might agree to a certain quantity of funding that medication at a certain price, but if the quantity goes beyond that price, then they expect the, um, the innovator to bear some of the cost of that additional usage. So that's quite interesting. So we're thinking about who's paying, how are they gonna pay, on what funding model and would they require um, things like risk sharing agreements. Um, and I, I think just to wrap up, there's quite a lot of this type of expertise I'm talking about at the University of Melbourne. So we sit in Centre for Health Policy um, in the School of Population Health and in, in my networks we have things like, we call it MVAC, which is the Melbourne Health Technology, Assess Health Technology and Value Assessment Collaborative. So the MVAC's available to collaborate with anyone that might be interested to understand more about particularly this fir fourth hurdle, value of their innovations. There's also what we call MISH, which is the Methods and Implementation Support for Clinical and Health Research Hub. And MISH do a lot of support around preparing evidence for this fourth hurdle, whether that's more on the clinical side or more on the economic side, MISH can help with that. Um, so please reach out to these sorts of university supports if you'd like further discussion or information, but I'll leave you with the next speakers. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kim. That was uh, very interesting. Gives insight to, to our own research and, and the impact we need to make and what roads we have to go down. Speaking of going down different roads, as a researcher, some have to make that big decision but do you leave your research to go down a path that you're interested in or not? And what happens when you want to come back in? And those are all the questions that um, people who are in that right on the edge of innovation and enterprise have to consider, teams have to consider that. And so we have today uh, Lauren Ayton, who's been one of those people who've taken that journey 
and uh, who, who will share her experiences with us uh, under the title Creating Impact as a Researcher in the Commercial World. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Peter. And thanks, Kim, for a really great introduction and I guess giving a bit of context to what I wanted to talk about. Just out of interest in the audience, who is a researcher? Yeah, great. So a very nice mix. That's good. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, I guess, my journey. Um, so I have been an academic and then gone into industry and then back into academia. So I wanted to share a little bit about some of my experiences. Um, and really what I wanted to start with was this great infographic that I found online, which is really uh, making us think about what we want our impact to be. So I think often when you go through an academic training program like a PhD, it's really about aiming for high impact journals and aiming for your science to be known worldwide. We're changing now and I'm really excited to see this changing into we want to make impact for patients. And so that's really what it's about. It's not the high impact journals, it's actually about helping patients. So one thing that we often hear in, in our role in, in INE within the faculty is people get quite nervous about the word commercialization. Innovation doesn't seem to be quite as scary, but commercialization really does scare people. And people start to think that what we're trying to do is make money and make, you know, become wealthy, wealthy, and that is not a good aim if you're in academia. But as Peter mentioned before, what it's actually about is getting innovations through to patients. And so I have a picture up here. On the left-hand side is one of the original cardiac pacemakers. It's actually fairly down the, far down the path, actually. The first ones were completely desk-bound. When the person was using the device, they had to be seated next to the machine. They then got to a point where they could be worn around the neck, such as in this picture. And of course now, um, pacemakers are completely implantable and are being used in huge numbers of people around the world. So this particular graph here is actually from one hospital in Perth and it's just showing over the years that the numbers of people that were getting cardiac pacemakers and obviously having huge improvements in their quality of life and their duration of life. And the key take home here is that that wouldn't have happened if pacemakers hadn't become commercialised because they needed industry funding, they needed industry minds, they needed the people power behind it to actually take it from a large, clunkier prototype through to what we have now. I wanted to also touch on something which I think for many of us in, in the audience, if you are thinking about going down this innovation and, and enterprise space, often we are faced with imposter syndrome. So if those of you who haven't heard this before, this is completely normal human nature. So we tend to think that everyone else that has trod this path before is better at it than we are or knows something that we don't. And we have this picture on the left-hand side where we believe that our skill set is very small. Everyone else knows a lot more than we do. But I love this image because on the right-hand side, it actually looks like a flower, which is a very lovely thing too. But it shows that our areas of expertise and our skill sets actually overlap. And that's really the strengths. That's why we get such fantastic innovations is when we work together. And so to talk a little bit, I think I've missed one of my slides, but I, I jumped um, across my first slide about my particular experience. So I did work um, on the Bionic Eye project here in Melbourne. So this was a medical device to help people get back some vision when they're blind. And that then led to a position in the US in industry. And I was over in the US for a couple of years working for a startup company. And what I really found from sort of the, the journey back and forth between the two is that, you know, we do obviously all think in similar ways. We're aiming for the same outcomes to get these devices through to patients. But there is definitely different ways of working. And for those of you in the audience who have either worked in industry or a, in a university, the speeds can be quite different in terms of how quickly and how agile different groups can be. And this is really important for these innovations. So I guess really my take home is that I think that in this innovation and enterprise space, we do need to engage not only with the consumers and people that have these conditions, but with industry and with our health systems as well. So for some reason, this has got around in the wrong order, but this is um, <laughs> the, what should be my first slide. Um, so a little bit about my background. So I uh, trained originally as an optometrist. I did a Bachelor of Optometry here at Melbourne University and then have moved, as I mentioned, from academia to industry and then back into academia. 
I've worked in medical devices, so in the bionic eye implants, both in Melbourne, but also in the US. Um, I worked for a company that spun out from Harvard University. Uh, and then we've come back to Australia and I'm now working in gene therapy. So still in these emerging therapeutics kind of area. Um, again, it's incredibly exciting to sort of be on that forefront of innovation, but it does throw up challenges. And so, as I mentioned before, the, the, what we can avoid is really trying to just focus on those high impact journals. We actually want to work more towards treatments for patients, but also for Im improving their life overall. So it's about the social equity, it's about improving community and helping people with different health conditions to get more from their life. Not so much about money. <laughs> Although, look, there is obviously improvements in socioeconomic um, situations for our society as a whole is important. So in terms of how we can help within the faculty, so for those of you who are within the university, these are potentially more, more of use to you, but of interest to everyone. What we're really aiming to do is provide people with resources to take their innovations from within the university and get them through to patients. So that might be with grants to help support some of the great ideas coming out. Education is a really important part of what we do and so we're really trying to help people to develop this mindset around being innovative in everything they do and getting their ideas out to patients. And networking is a large part as well of what we can offer within the university in terms of connecting people in industry and within health systems and, and patients and people with the conditions themselves with the researchers to get those ideas out to people. Uh, and I think I just wanted to let end on um, support. You know, that's a really key thing. When you're taking a bit of a jump and going into a new space and trying to be a bit more innovative about what you do, it can be very scary. So it's really important to have your support team around you. And so that's something that is very much accessible through the university and other places. So thank you very much. And I will pass on to the next speaker. Thanks very much. Uh, so Buzz is coming to the podium and, and talking about support. Um, perhaps the greater portion of the last five or six years, Buzz has really been in, in that situation where he's trying to create an ecosystem to support those great ideas. And uh, as the CEO of the MedTech Actuator, he will explain to you the impact he's had on people like me and you, uh, us, uh, who, who are really trying to take that idea to fruition. So he'll talk about incubating ideas that make impact on health challenges. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have to quickly change my talk, given now that I'm, I'm joking. Fine. So, uh, so look, uh, great to see you all. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to follow on a little bit from what uh, Lauren was saying. Um, so I think we, we live in a really interesting world in health where we walk into a hospital, we walk into a clinic, and we expect something to be there. We expect a technology to be there, a medicine to be there, a system to be there, and if it's not there, we get upset about it. And I think part of, part of innovation is, well, the, these, these things don't just happen. There has to be a creative process of crazy ideas. There has to be a creative process of innovation as well, and then commercialization, which is a word we don't like, but it's just the reality of the game and commercialization. I often think about the end product as, as fruit. Everybody likes to harvest. Everybody likes the juiciest fruit, the one that's going to work, the one that's going to taste the best, the one that's going to give us the most satisfaction. But they don't just occur. And if we think about when we grow a tree, an apple tree, an orange tree, whatever it might be, we have to nurture that tree. And it's exactly the same in health innovation. Uh, we have to think about how we plow the fields. So when we, when we think about early stage innovation, early stage, we, we've got to allow an openness, a conversation. We've got to allow a scenario in which those ideas can flow. And it's comfortable for those ideas to flow. We can't assume the best idea is going to be there straight away. So we have to nurture the field. We have to nurture the people, nurture the scientists, the clinicians, the researchers. Everyone has to have this kind of nurturing element about it, which is part of what we do as well. We give you the massages and everything that you need to, to nurture your idea. So we plow the field. We plow the field and, and we clear the field of weeds, of trees, of rocks and things like that. So we make it more amenable and more functional and more capable for people to grow those ideas, to think about those ideas. Then we have to sow the seed. And you don't just sow a seed in any old soil. So an avocado tree grows very differently to an orange tree, to a plum tree. Uh, and so you have to really be very specific about the type of support that you give 
those early stage ideas. You've got to give them some water. You've got to free them from predators. You've got to allow them to, to really function and to grow in a way that's protected. And, and part of this nurturing idea is that we should do that as a society, as an ecosystem as well. And then the early seedlings grow, and then they grow into great big trees, and then we have the great innovations, the products, the fruit that everybody is after. But actually what we can do, and we're starting to see this idea that we could incubate seedlings. We can actually try and uh, connect the right parts of the ecosystem together. So we can bring them into a greenhouse, if you will, into a university setting, into an incubator kind of setting, in which we partner them with the right people, the right soil. We feed them in the right way. Not too much, not too little, but enough so that they can grow their technology, they can grow their tree in a way that makes sense for them. Because no two trees, no two, no two innovations grow in the same way. They all require a different kind of, uh, of, um, of nurturing whether it's structuring nurturing. So if you're a technology that's looking to be a licensed technology, an exit technology, a social innovation technology, which is very different, we have to present that in a slightly different way. It's not one model fits all. And the same with when we're growing plants and trees. And I, I, I appreciate you, you like my analogy here with plants and trees. Um, but the point is, we can bring them into a greenhouse. And that's kind of what we're doing here at the university. It's kind of what we're doing in Australia. And when we think about how we can really develop them, We've got to bring in the right capability and the right support uh, in the space. And, of course, we'll deliver the harvest over time. And not everything is going to work, and that's okay. But the interesting word is impact. And impact is kind of, um, it means something different to everybody. And I think kind of understanding what impact means to different people around the ecosystem is, is really important as well. So learning the different languages of impact. In our world, of course, impact is very, very clear helping society, people flourish in a, in, a, in a better, brighter, healthier way. It makes complete sense when we live and breathe in health. If you're in finance, it's a very different kind of space. The impact is capital returns. It's how much money you're going to make for our investors. Uh, in, in the government, impact, yes, also means human flourishing, but it's more about growth, jobs, economic growth. And so understanding this word impact is really key, and understanding that it means different things to different people allows you then to really position your technology, your positioning, your, your startup, your venture, your idea in a different kind of way. So I encourage you to really think about the word impact and just make sure that you have a good understanding about what that means to different people in the ecosystem. So how do we enable impact? What should we do? How do we allow innovations to really, really, really grow and develop into these beautiful technologies that have the ability to save lives, to enable lives, to create a different kind of lifestyle uh, for all of us? And, and one thing that I want to talk about is when we think about impact and we think about innovation, we also think about the word entrepreneurship. And having worked with hundreds and hundreds of startups over the years, I'm a big believer that entrepreneurship is a skill. I think you're born with some entrepreneurial tendencies for sure. You're a little bit, you're happy to take a different kind of risk. You're a little bit more, you know, uh, uh, sort of in a leadership position where you do something a little bit different. But in my opinion, I think it's a skill. I don't think it's necessarily an education. And, and, and my, my understanding of this and my experience of this is if, if I could read every book in the world on entrepreneurship and then suddenly play the game and expect to be a world-class entrepreneur because that's how we expect entrepreneurs to be. But if you relate it to soccer, you could read every book in the world you want to about soccer. Get on the pitch, you're not going to be a world-class player without practicing. There's some skills involved. Entrepreneurship is the same. You've got to learn the skills of entrepreneurship. You've got to learn how to negotiate. You've got to learn how to think about finance. You've got to understand the go-to-market strategies that are needed. You've got to understand the, both the innovation pipeline and the commercialization pipeline and manage expectations from that perspective as well. So I think entrepreneurship is a genuine skill that you need to practice and play and learn. And in the university, we have lots of opportunities for you to do that. In fact, in Melbourne, in Victoria, in Australia, lots of opportunities for you to play that game as well and learn the basics of entrepreneurship, trial and test it. The good thing about university, I think, is if you're within the university, and some of you are, some of you aren't, but if you're in the university, where better, where better to trial an innovation than in the walls of a university? If it fails, it was an educational lesson. We've learned something, fantastic, great tick. But if it succeeds, the university has gates and doors that you can walk through and build an even greater opportunity. So I encourage you to really trial your crazy ideas within the walls of the university because there's so much support for you to take it to the next level. 
And if it fails, that's okay. Part of failing really allows you to understand what you did wrong and how you might not do uh, uh, the same thing uh, over again. If you've done a PhD, PhDs are the best, in my opinion, uh, entrepreneurs, because they know failure. Gee, do they know failure. If you've done a, a PhD, things fail every bloody day. Your cells die, your incubator fails, your thesis has to get is eaten by the dog, whatever it might be. So embracing failure is really key because it's, it's, a real, it's a real learning lesson for many, many people. I failed a startup. I know what it's like to, to fail everything and to lose everything. But to get back up and do it again, that's brave. That's courageous. But you don't make the same mistake twice. As investors, the idea that you've had a failure, you understand what that feels like, allows you then to be a much more successful entrepreneur. It's a skill. But pathway to impact is interesting. And uh, in health, it's really interesting. Because when we think about uh, uh, impact in health, we're all thinking the same thing, as I said before. But it's kind of a different story in the world of industry and in the world of corporates. Impact isn't necessarily about changing people's lives. It's about the bottom dollar. How much capital can you make an individual? Uh, and so part of the challenge is, and we talk about social innovation, but I'll talk a bit more in just a second. Part of the challenge is, well, how do we drive impact? You know, and, and, and what do we mean by impact? So is impact creating the newest hospitals in the world that have the most incredible technologies that allow developed nations to help their societies live better? Or is impact helping people from Bangladesh stop using pieces of cloth to filter their water in the hope that they're not going to get cholera. Both are impact. On the left-hand side, is a cancer diagnostic more impactful in Kenya than it is in Australia? I don't think so. I think part of it, we've related impact over the years to deprivation, and actually it's not. I think, I think impact is about any human flourishing, having the right and access to health. Uh, and so what is the pathway to impact? It's not just about bringing in external capital from venture capitalists to create your multi-million dollar technology. It's also about creating technologies to help those that can't necessarily afford those type of uh, expenses, those type of high level products. So, so it's, it's got to be both. And I think we're starting to move towards a different kind of era of health innovation where traditionally it was all about venture capitalists, private equity, taking technologies to market. But now actually you find that most founders are driven by human flourishing. We want to make sure that everybody has access to human health technology, not just those that can afford it. So we're, moving, we're starting to see this trend happening. The challenge is that we're using the same old models we've used for 50 years in health innovation. We're using venture capitalists. We're using private equity. And, and their returns are what they're focused on and, and uh, what their deliverable is. So how do we change that? I think the next decade is going to be really telling. I think we're in a beautiful position right now that we can start testing new financial models around social innovation. How can we start thinking about driving the bottom billions capability and adding value to that part of the market? So hopefully I think we're starting to see this, this maneuverability of impact capital coming into a slightly different way than before and funding perhaps high volume, uh, uh, low cost technologies in marketplaces that we weren't able to get to before. So it's a, it's a beautiful time to think about health innovation. Uh, we're going to see the next 10 years really drive health innovation in a different kind of way. And I'm really hoping that we're going to see less or, or more than just 1% of innovations being the social innovation space where we can genuinely try helping at uh, the bottom billion. One thing that I've learned over the years in this game that you have to include the village. When you think about commercialization, when you think about innovation in health, there's usually about 40 very specific strategic directions you have to make. And no one person, going to Lawrence Point, no one person knows all of that, whether it's manufacturing, clinical trials, regulations, whether it's you know, supply chains, distribution, whatever it may be. And so working with the ecosystem is absolutely key. But thinking about the structure of your business as well, if you are a social innovation, well, there's different pathways you will take to market compared to those that are a typical venture capital based uh, innovation. But build your ecosystem. At the university, we have huge amounts of uh, connections and networks across uh, the world, actually, and I encourage you to, to draw down on those. But I think for us to change the status quo, we need a new type of leadership as well. And we need a groundswell of uh, grassroots innovation coming through. And I think it's time to take some risks in health uh, as well and start thinking about how we can do things a little bit differently, not just for those that can afford it, but for those that have the, that have the ability or have the need 
uh, for, uh, for new health technologies. So thank you very much for your time, uh, and thank you. Thanks, Buzz. Very insightful, bringing together the whole idea of uh, social and commercial enterprise. And, and last night I was talking to my daughter about this symposium and, and about success and failure, and she said something really quite, uh, quite poignant. She said, maybe it's not about success and or failure. Maybe it's just about putting your hand up for the challenge. You know? and, and I think in, in many respects we worry about that as researchers, what sort of challenge we, we would put our, our hands up for. Um, what we're going to do now is move to the panel discussion, my panel, uh, and um, we'll, we'll run that for about 20 minutes or so and then throw it open to the floor and hopefully organically we've uh, inspired you to think up some questions, um, the question you always wanted to ask but you didn't dare ask or whatever. Uh, we do have the experts on deck and uh, perhaps if I, if I could start with Olivia um, as our impact lead for the faculty. Is, is, the, is the faculty heading in the right direction in terms of balancing the drive to be a research-intensive uh, university and the social responsibility of doing good? I know that's you know, a co somewhat contorted question, but it, it's the one that I think allows perhaps a, a, a spirited discussion about whether we're doing something right or wrongly. Is it working? Yeah. Um, look, I think I think we're heading in the right direction in terms of there seems to be a very uh, unified, I guess, feeling around where we should be heading, which is exactly what you described. But it's a wicked problem, and I think in in my mind, where things really get tricky is is not just dollars but time, and um, and I think it's really balancing out these priorities. And often in a academic context or university context. There's lots of competing sort of targets and, and, and desires. So I think one thing that's been really helpful recently is, is, I guess, turning a spotlight on the wicked problem that is thinking about how do we manage um, a, a successful sort of uh, career in academia that allows people the time to fail and put their hand up and not be penalised that they, they tried some sort of thing or put in the hours that involved in the, in the um, end user consultation. You know, these sorts of things are absolutely critical but don't often have a, a spot in your, you know, in your annual review. What did you do this year? Well, I failed three or four times, you know, and I had some very interesting conversations with some important um, sort of government end users. It's hard to really, um, I guess, document that appropriately and get that, that uh, recognised. And I think there's an understanding that this is what we need to be doing and that we need to be encouraging people to take risks. And there is now a lot of work going into thinking about and, and creating the structures around documenting the pathways to impact, I guess, so that if you get three quarters of the way down an impact journey and you hit a, a roadblock and want to go in the other direction, you don't have an empty sort of transcript or, or sort of CV to talk to and that if, the, if you're learning along the way, you can present that in a way that's not career-ending, I think. Um, so I, I'm, I'm positive about where the, the future sort of uh, is going and I think money doesn't grow on trees but we can do a better job of... Um, of managing time and recognising people's time so that it's risks aren't, aren't really penalised um, in, in the university structure. Yeah. Lauren, you were telling a story about your experiences in, in North America, what your CEO said to you about employing people who succeeded or failed. Do you want to share that with us? Yeah, it was one of the really fascinating things. So I um, I should say, when I got to the US, I got very much thrown in the deep end. It was a very small startup. I had to kind of run <laughs> before I could walk there. But he made a really interesting comment. So this this gentleman was the CEO of IBM. He was one of the um, one of the senior directors for IBM previously and then our CEO. And he made some comment that when he was working at IBM, he didn't want to employ someone if they hadn't failed at a startup. He said it was really those people that had tried and failed were actually his best employees. So he very much instilled that into us, which was really good mm. to so hear. 
Yeah, so how do you apply that in a setting like we have at Melbourne, where you have a very constrained environment, the dollar has to go a certain distance, picking up on what Olivia said, where you know, we only mark you on certain things and not on others. How how do you think what do you think the future should look like if we were trying as leaders to encourage innovation in in uh, the younger community coming up under our charge as it were? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it does come back to support, really. So I think it's about having a, a network around people that want to do this, that support them, so that if they do fall, we're kind of there to catch them. So things, for, so simple things, for example, so publications, so if people need to keep publishing for their academic career, you know, can we have them work within a team where they can still contribute, still be having that kind of output while they're still looking at their innovative project too? Um, but I think it is... Probably, you know, and, and as Olivia said, it is a wicked problem because it's changing a lot of the the ways that universities work. But I would really like to see universities value this and, and recognise that people will stumble, but they have to do that before they go ahead and run. Mm. And, and Buzz, as someone who's had to incubate these ideas and um, help them fail, uh, help them fail quickly at least, um, what are your thoughts about a university, a very traditional university system, trying to emerge out of the swamp, as it were, into this area? Yeah, look, I think I think it's uh, I think it's important to fail fast. You, you don't want to waste your time on something that has no basis of a commercial or, or, or innovative product. I think part of it is just giving that kind of early stage education around how you're able to validate things nice and early and understand how you use that in a dynamic way for a project. We're not talking about a startup at this point, we're talking about projects. And, and, and going to your point earlier, you talked about the, uh, the, the pacemaker. Well, the pacemaker was, was designed by a clinician who just wanted to try something different to help a patient live with um, uh, different types of, um, of heart issues. And so I think part of it is that allowing, them, allowing failure to happen and, and, and celebrate failure and talk about failure and, and, and don't make it such a uh, hide under the table but allow others to learn from failure uh, as well. And I'm sure there's lots and lots of examples where we've tried things in the university that just haven't quite worked out for various reasons, and it's been okay, but we don't really talk about that. So I'd love to see a, a movement in which we can talk about the things that haven't quite worked, so that we can all learn from that and be inspired by that as well, because I'm sure there's some common failure points that people are experiencing that actually they could have avoided quite easily if they'd just known about them. So I, I think there's more of a community social concept here around failure. Mm. Kim, you know, where you, from your presentation, you, you have a different lens on this. Yours is now at the top table. It's going to go, yes, we'll regulate that it's to be used policy-wise or not. What do you think about all this conversation about failure and get in and try it and, you know, it doesn't really matter? What do you think? I think that um, I guess if I'm starting from looking where the policy makers and, and a policy maker could be not just government, it could be any funder basically, anyone who's eventually going to fund, I just think it's worth lifting our head there earlier because all m and it's this, I think it's a it's a universe an academic problem that we put our heads down <laughs> and we're good at detail and we look down. But I think there's value in just our heads going up earlier and thinking where could this end up and look further ahead earlier and engage in those discussions because I think that could also help us to f succeed or fail quicker too if we understand like what are the genuine needs and gaps in how our innovation could contribute and, and what are the requirements <laughs> from policymakers on us of, of making that to to succeed so I think it's something about lifting our heads up earlier and anticipating the needs of the end users whether it's patients consumers funders well on that point it's about identifying what the gap is and being relevant to the gap yeah. but if you're talking let's say about preventative care you know you want to prevent something from happening before it happens how do you have a comparator for what you're trying to do because you're not actually treating the condition yet you know, how, how do you how how should one approach that? I think it's what you do if you don't have the new thing is the comparator. <laughs> so sometimes the comparator is doing nothing, right? We might not actively be trying to prevent that thing at all, and that becomes the comparator. So it's whatever you're doing in the absence of the new thing you would want to do. Yeah. So so if, for example, is it valid to 
to look at all the things that are being done in preventing something and how do you pick a valid comparator. It, it, it's a difficult situation. It could be like two fish slapping it over someone's yeah. head and saying, yeah. you know, you're going to get better now. You know, some, I mean, in, I think about in health, we kind of do, deal with that from time to time. The but thing that would be replaced in practice, and yeah. sometimes it's a market share of a number of things that mm. would be replaced in practice. But the one thing I really, like, wish is that innovation, what we see is pockets of innovation in one area. Like, and I see this with the, the medicines um, and the devices, y you end up with a whole heap coming down the pipeline for just one condition. Yeah. And I kind of wish that I just didn't have so many comparators and that people were more like picking the gaps where there weren't so many things rather than, tr yeah. Mm. So I think that can become an issue too when one area, and if we looked up earlier, we would see it was crowded. Maybe it's crowded because it's profitable, but it's not necessarily crowded because that's where the greatest human need is. Mm. Okay, yeah. so so Olivia, in, in terms of making impact and where the university, the faculty should have its sights on, um, w w we often have this debate, and I think you've been at the deanery exec and you've discussed, you know, how do we go about making impact? And it would seem to me there are as many ideas of what impact should be in our faculty as there are people discussing it. You know, and if you're the one who designed the hammer, well, I'm looking for a nail, you know, that's my impact point, as it were, versus the community need, you know, global burden of disease. Maybe that is the gap that we should be dealing with. What are your thoughts about how, how a faculty, how a group of people, how a department should start thinking about targets for impact? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I think... So I haven't, I, w I wouldn't say I've been at meetings where the end goal has been to determine what the target should be. And I think, I hope that that continues, that I think it gets very dangerous, not dangerous, but what a university really offers is a lot of very motivated individuals and ideally they all, I like the point about putting your head up and finding the gap with the expertise you bring. So. My personal view is probably a, a, a small group of executive, a, a possibly least, least best place to predict where the real innovation is going to come from and when there's a huge diversity of people within the But the, in, the But faculty. in a cash-strapped sort of environment, you know, we have conversations about, gee, we a limited amount of money, we want to make research count for something. Yeah, yeah. We can't all just do what we want. No. I mean, you hear these conversations, whether you, you participate in them or not, we all hear about them. Yeah. And it strikes the chord one way or the other, off key or on key. Mm. What are your thoughts about that? So I guess w what I think would be the real end goal is to have the structures put in place where th if the idea would be that opportunity for impact or innovation was not afforded to some and was only afforded to others, I think that whatever system sets that up would not be ideal. Um, obviously, there'd be some areas that when you look around as a university, you think there are areas where we seem to have more expertise or more leadership that the opportunity to actually leverage, you know, in certain areas will be greater here than others. You know, one thing that's come up recently in a lot of conversations I've been around is around the genetic diversity and the social diversity that exists within Melbourne. You know, there are some things that we sort of geographically, we have assets that give us a competitive edge over other places. So, so do you think you should just focus on that? No, 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 so, I do so not. So if you take University <laughs> of Waterloo, for example, yeah. Buzz, I don't know, if, you know, with, with um, uh, the, device, um, the phone, BlackBerry, they decided we're going to do maths. That's all we're going to do. Yeah. Because we've got such great mathematicians, that's all we're going to do. Yeah. So they got Stephen Hawking in, making him a, you know, a professor there, and, and that's all they did. And out came pop things like BlackBerry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What do you think about that as an incubator specialist, Buzz? You know, refining the group versus incubating anything that comes through with a good idea. Yeah, look, I, th I think there's something about that. I think part of part of the good thing about innovation is that you don't always have to have the idea. 
you, it's, it's a people, right? And as the people come together and you focus on something really cool and you get diversity of thoughts and diversity of, of, uh, of um, opportunity, then really cool things can just happen. And so I think, that's, I think that's really interesting. But I think Waterloo is positioned in a very different space to Melbourne. You know, you've already got large corporates driving innovation on that border and across the border. Mm. And, and, and we do know that the greatest innovation ecosystems in the world, whether it's Boston, London, Eindhoven, they're all, they've got three things in common. Really strong government, really strong academic capability, and really strong corporates pulling innovation in. We're missing that here in Melbourne and Australia generally. So we're missing one of the mm. key elements. So we've got to look at more of a disruptive model, I think. So how can we do that? And, and, and we've got to look from a global perspective as well. And I do wonder whether the social innovation pathway is something that we as a university or we as a city or a state can really benefit from, can really kind of take a leading position in that and just incubate those sort of ideas or those kind of thoughts. Because in, in, in health in general, I mean, BlackBerry was interesting. And when BlackBerry kind of went over, Google came to, to Waterloo and then they all went to Google and you had all these massive startups coming in. So you, ha you already have this kind of innovative company distributing innovation ideas across a community. We need a bit of that. I think, and the question is how can we create that from a different kind of perspective? So how can we change the model? How can we add some other uh, element of value that's going to allow us to think differently without with the absence of the large corporates? And this is where I think the social innovation play is something that's kind of interesting. Do you think in your view, I mean, you've, you've done Asia, you've done Europe, you've done the African horn, you know, um, do you think that I is a really big lever we could pull the social side of it? Yeah, I, I do. I think I think Australians and people that live here are naturally kind of driven by that. You know, it's uh, certainly the generations that I see doing startups now are so driven by the genuine human impact. You know, the, some of them like Ferraris and stuff, but most of them are driven by this idea of impact. I can't imagine anyone. Like <laughs> so how how can we create that? So I think if we've already got that mindset in a city like this, in a state like this, how can we really develop that? further and how can we encourage them and give them the pathway forward so we're going to incubate ideas let's try something a little bit different let's stand away from the crowd and try to to, to leverage something that we know is already within the community mm. so so lauren you spent your entire research life looking at you know the gene therapy and the bionic eye and you went to the states and you've come back here you've you've come back you know and, and you think why did you come back I mean, what drove you? What madness was that? <laughs> well, it's a lot warmer here than upstate New York right now. Uh, no, look, it's funny actually. So I came back and I actually was saying to someone the other day, I feel like there is so much more innovation and entrepreneurial mindsets in Melbourne than when I left. And I don't know if it's because it's how my mind has changed over the years as well. But I think it's so exciting, to be honest. I feel like we are in this fledgling position. And, and when I was in the States, I spent a lot of time at Boston and all these amazing hubs. And they're doing things that are very exciting. But they are. They're sort of 20, 30 years down the track. And we are now at the chance where we get to direct which way, you know, we do things yeah. in Victoria. So so would you say that in, in Boston, London, Eindhoven, that for them... Um, Innovation is not optional. It's, it's a, what they do. It's a really good point, actually. I remember the first day that I walked onto the campus of MIT in Boston. And, like, I just remember walking on and there was a couple of young guys walking past and they were talking about their idea for a startup company. And they would have been, I reckon, first or second year university students. And I just remember going, wow, that's amazing. And I think you're right. Like, it's, it's just this mindset of, you know, when you go to a place like that, if you're at Stanford, for example... It's almost an expectation that you will push your work and push your ideas out into the community. And I think we have an opportunity to do that too. Mm. So, so, Kim, from your perspective, it's about the funder, efficacy, cost effectiveness, making impact that benefits society. And we're, there are only 27 million of us, so you can come to a decision pretty quickly about whether it's going to work or not. What do you think of a robot that you could create running off AI that you put into a nursing home to help chat with people. Right? What do you think about that as a concept um, that the funder would come at or not, whether it's efficacious or not, whether you think it's for social good or not? What do you think of that? I kind of come at it the other way. Like, rather than starting with the robot, and <laughs> like I come at it with starting with the nursing home. Right. Like, what, what does the nurse... Yeah. 
Yeah, like, so what does the nursing home think of the robot? And what are the aged care participants think of the robot? But let's say out there 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 is a company. Let's say some medical students from engineering. No, some engineering students think, I want to use AI, I want to use robot, and a robot that just talks or is there, is the company. Is the company for an area where there is just insufficient staff to keep people engaged and thinking? So I'm always back to need, like I'm always on need. So where's the need for the technology? And I think any of those technologies could have enormous need and impact, but I think you need the alignment with the need Mm. so that the technology is positioned to fill a need. Does it have to fill a need? And this is quite important because there'll be people preparing for the next investigator grant or whatever you like, you know, and thinking about that very concept because it actually has to join two dots, fill that gap. Does the need... Do you have to be comprehensive across the needs? Or should you pick one and make a great narrative behind it? Or as many as you can? Yeah, I think any of that. But it's just the link, isn't it? Like, it's having that link to need. Um, and sh- Because that's how can we have impact if we're not aligned to need? Mm. So. Um, but being disruptive sometimes is not about a need, is it? Well, Who maybe, we, about but we PCR? need to. Di- we, maybe it's that's just an earlier step, right? But ultimately, a disruption needs to always end up meeting a need yeah. of, of a better way of doing something, right? So, it might disrupt early, but you've got to meet a <laughs> need later. So, I think I'm always focused on, and and I understand that many technologies are developed without knowing the need initially. But at some point, I think there has to be that alignment to the need to have the impact, the level of impact we might want. Mm. Yeah. Olivia, what do you think about what Buzz was saying, you know, that in Melbourne what characterises us and also a reflection on, on what Lauren was saying, that coming back and comparing with two global positions around the world, that we, we have a social contract, we have a social conscience that is really strong and should be used as a major lever in terms of what we do. What do you think about that? I think it's true. I think we should be using, well, I guess we have as Australia good, repre- um, uh, what Im- we've made a good impression on the rest of the world. We're just hosting a group of Japanese recently and they were commenting how much they really aligned with the way, I guess, the approach to science here in, in Melbourne and doing things properly, doing things not just uh, precisely, but also sort of doing things for the right reason. So I think we should leverage that as much as we can if this is something that we're, we're known for. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, in, I think I'm also more aligned with this sort of question of, of need, you know, to align not just... Well, we've, we've got a collection of people over here that are very good at doing X, but sort of pummel money over there. It's where where are the opportunities, really do a broad scan of opportunities and really think about how we can use, you know, the most, get the most out of this amazing diversity of of people we have within the state and within the university, junior people, senior Mm. people and Mm. and all of that. Kim? Um, Just on that point, it's something I've been thinking about, which is what's our strategic advantage at this university? And I think it... It is a little bit around that too. It's like the intellectual pulling power that we have across so many different um, diverse skill sets that we're in a position to solve complex problems and big problems that perhaps other institutions might not be so well positioned to solve. But that relies on us bringing together the expertise that we have here around... Yeah, but I think we can solve some things that can't be solved elsewhere. Do you think we do that well enough? I, I think it is very valued here. Like, um, it's valued as a value set that we work with each other and across different disciplines. So I definitely see that coming through. But surely, I mean, th- there's always room to do it better, right, and to do more. Mm. Yeah. But Buzz, uh, you know, you've, you've seen the different universities acting. You interact with lots of universities. Where would you put University of Melbourne in terms of that that connectability, the way we do things, the, the call to action in terms of social enterprise and things like that. I mean, I'm paid a salary by the University of Melbourne, so I would say it's extremely... A oh, conflict of interest <laughs> has been declared. So now that the disclosure has been made, please speak freely. <laughs> no, look, I think, I think, um, I think 
part of it is that Melbourne is privileged anyway in health innovation. We've got we've got you know we've got the, the Parkville precinct, the hospital systems here are just uh, outstanding. Um, going to Kim's point and, and to Olivia's point, I think at some point we've got to take a bit of a risk and just kind of step out of the crowd a little bit. And I think Melbourne's quite good at doing that. And I think the University of Melbourne has been good at doing that. And I think now it's just trying to figure out what we do in this new sort of wave in health. We know that health is changing dramatically. We know they have the ability to be part of that change and to disrupt that change. Uh, so I think part of it is just having that sort of leadership moment uh, within the university that says, actually, we're, we're going to try something a little bit different. Let's take a risk. If it doesn't work, it's okay. We'll, we'll learn from it. But I think we're in a moment now that the fact that the conversation is happening suggests that we might see a different sort of strategy coming out of it. Uh, but I think we're hugely well placed uh, and going to the point where we've got such a diverse of intellectual capability. I mean, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. You put those people in a room uh, with a challenge and, and watch the opportunities that come out of it. And I think if we could get to a moment where we do that and we're not just bringing the, the traditional people in, the, the, the medics, the engineers, but the, the administrational people, the, the public health people, they're bringing all those into a room and saying, look, let's try and design something a little bit different. Let's try and design something for the next decade, not, not here and now, but for the next 10 years. And, and that's the challenge. And it'll be amazing to see what models of care, what product technologies, what um, uh, creations come out of just those conversations alone. But I think we just need to step outside the crowd a little bit, make a different kind of noise, and try and do some. Be, be a pirate, Peter. Be a pirate. So, so Lauren, you, you've come back, and um, as a leader, you, you have a team that is really very fine in terms of your focus of what you're trying to achieve. What sort of risk are you taking? What sort of pirate are you? <laughs> oh, I love it. I have a three-year-old, so I'm quite often dressed up as a pirate. <laughs> um, I think that what we are trying to do is, uh, with my team, we're trying to expose our group to new challenges. And so, you know, for, um, for example, we work a lot with startup companies and with industry partners. And so we're doing sort of little sabbaticals, for example, where some of my team go out and, and work with that. We're really we're very passionate within my team about speaking with the patients so we we always are working with people with eye diseases and with vision impairment and blindness to learn what they want and sort of really targeting what we do from from that point as well oh in terms of you know being a pirate i think it's just about you know taking these opportunities you know and, and just having a risk that that's sort of what how i see it jumping off the gangplank Gang so on that point, I now throw it open to the audience and ask if anyone wants to jump off the gangplank by asking the first <laughs> question. Please. Yes. friends and fools and all that sort of stuff. You talked about innovative models of funding now. Um, what what what, have you, what are you seeing, or what would you like to see? I, th I think you said, um, you know, social. So I'm assuming crowdfunding type stuff. And and you also talked about corporate partnerships, which are really lacking in Melbourne. Just your your opinions on where we should be taking it. Yeah, look, I, I think the, the challenge that I'm seeing in the marketplace now. So we we've got about 200 startups now in the in the portfolio. So the challenge that we're seeing is that. They are very diverse in, in, the, in the pathways that they're taking to market, in the markets that they're looking to uh, address, in the technologies. But there's only a single funding model, and that is family, friends and fools, angel seed round, venture capital, private. It, it, so that's a very linear pathway, and that doesn't fit with the direction of this new health system. And so if it doesn't fit, you don't get funded, and so you have to go offshore. What we're starting to see is, is a real movement towards uh, there's two there's two sort of movements. One is this kind of impact investing, and one is philanthropic investing. So gone are the days of this idea that I'm going to give you, you know, $2 million and kind of watch, but I'm going to try and invest in you as a philanthropic kind of consideration where I'm okay with a two times return as long as you make significant human impact as opposed to the traditional private equity route where we've got to be 10 to 20 times return. So I think part of it is trying, how do we bring different kinds of, and Australia's bad at this by the way, how do we bring different kinds of impact capital, impact orientated capital into the grounds of health innovation? Now they'll fund new infrastructure because that's an obvious one to sort of fund. You can kind of see how that might work. Uh, they might fund other parts of um, 
of agriculture as well in, in other countries and, and so forth. But I think if we can, if we can build models of, in, of, 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 of uh, impact investment that allow um, those social innovation directions where we know, so I've, I've seen startups fail because their profit margins are less than 10% or you know, their return is like one times or two times, but the impact is humongous. And so there's this big argument about, well, if we can, if we can help a thousand people a year live happier, healthier and stronger, but the profit margin is only two times, then, then that's, that's gonna fail. But how do we make sure that they don't fail? That we encourage that kind of investment model to succeed. And I think it's gonna come from the private markets. I think it's gonna come from the family office, the philanthropy, the impact investment modes, but we've just got to introduce them to health. They're not traditionally in health. We do a really bad job at marketing our health capability in terms of innovation. And, and we've got so much to market, we just do it really badly. So I think we've got to try and present a different sort of scenario on the marketplace and just allow these, these giant uh, philanthropic and, and investment, impact investment houses to see our capability in the space. That's what I want to see. I want to try and bring a different kind of, of uh, impact investment model to Australia. Other questions? Yep, please. Yeah. Uh, please, if it comes to mind. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the uplifting conversation. Um, this is quite uplifting for myself. Um, I've built two healthcare companies on the lookout for my third, and I hope it's uh, with somebody from Uni Melbourne. Um, I wanted to ask a question around incentives, because you talked about being different. Um, if you could think out loud, what sort of incentive structure would you put in for somebody going to Uni Melbourne around innovating, around really thinking about future of health, uplifting and elevating? human health, what, what incentives would you put in place? Yeah, it's kind of a tough one, isn't it? I, I think part of, so I think, I think in incentives, uh, so traditionally they're around publications, of course, and so forth. And I think we're now seeing a move towards some universities doing IP. So IP becomes incentive. My old university in London, for instance, you get, I you, your, your career path is actually based just as much on IP uh, as, as much as, um, as, much as um, publications. I think an incentive should be around your ability to be involved in a startup as well. So trying to, uh, so what we know is that there's, there's, two, there's two modes of startup innovation. You've got the grassroots, which is going to happen from the researchers, from the students, from that kind of uh, earlier phase uh, part of the, the university. And then you've got the, the top end, the, the leadership uh, route. That bit's really hard to change. But I think if we can encourage them for a t like to be a, a tenured professor, for instance, the encouragement to be involved in startups and deliver that kind of value to, to create your um, career path, I think would be really, really very useful. Because the thing is, the the kind of the, the senior academic staff have so much skill, so much skill, so much connection, so much network, so much capability, but we're just not utilizing that in the innovation space in the way that we probably could. So I think incentivizing them by being involved in startups allows them to develop their career path, but also, you know, they could have shareholdings in these businesses as well. This idea that you take a small snippet of equity in an early stage business can work out really well. So there's some financial incentive there, and, and a lot of people can work quite fast and effectively when there's a financial incentive. So I think we've just got to think a little bit differently to not just around publications, but trying to contribute to, to kind of innovation and more broader um, uh, concept. Kim, do you, Kim, do you uh, have, a, have a perspective on that? Um, incentives. Um, I think different people will have different incentives. Like there's going to be a reasonable proportion that will be incentivized in the same way that we're talking about the funding models for the investors. They'll be incentivized by seeing a pathway to impact. Um, and a l that's enough for a lot of academics to see that, that their work could be impactful. Um, and I think the other one is flexibility. Like at the moment, we're, we're quite traditional in what we're expecting our researchers to be working on. So I think incentives around flexibility may help them to be more involved in some of those activities. And academics tend to value autonomy. So <laughs> flexibility might work, mm. but I think it could be worth understanding more about. Yeah, what about Lauren? You, you've come all the way back. There must have been some incentive to come. <laughs> family <laughs> miss my family but no no look um i think uh we've and we talked about it before as well and, mm. and i know there's a lot of discussions at the university is about this concept of a, a safety net you know so if, if someone is going to sort of go that path you know knowing that they can come back into the fold um, and look i think i have been pretty lucky like you know I, i've come back into the university mm. at a time when this is really valued so the fact that I have worked at a startup company is actually a good thing 
Whereas 10 years ago, it might have been a very different story. So I think we just need to encourage people to do that. Mm. Lydia. In fact, I think, Laura, your last point is, is exactly what I was going to say, that, you know, equity and IP and, and, and dollars is obviously a clear incentive. But I think at the moment, it's, there's more, there's a, a lot of disincentives to engage. And so exactly the point, the idea that a few years ago is absolutely the case, that if you left academia and had ex experience in, in industry, well, that was okay, but you may as well have taken time off to go, you know, renovate a, a house or something. It was just a time away from the academic path. And I think a lot can be achieved by just recognising and explicitly valuing, especially the sort of junior academics, you know, the, the joke about the sort of tenure prof professor can go off and do more creative things because they feel secure in their position. But I think a lot could change by just sort of emotional incentivization of saying it's, it's great if you encourage people to do so and make sure that these sorts of opportunities are not the thing that you have to do at 5 p.m. on a Sunday because the rest of your week is taken up by everything else. So I think that type of rec genuine recognition and valuing from the employer um, would, would help a lot. So, so to your question... Um, as someone who's trying to catch the next startup, be there to really pump it up, what would you like to see as being an incentive to power up that group? Oh, wow, I didn't realise I'd get the question to myself. Oh, hang on, this is, this is the special <laughs> symposium. The questioner gets the question. Well, well I, I'd like to... Well, startups are inevitably hard. And one thing I'd like to see, perhaps being on the other side, is uh, somebody who could genuinely be committed to the roller coaster ride. Historically, um, you know, out of Toronto, I was trying to partner it up with um, a clinical scientist. And every time we would try to meet, it came conflicting with his, uh, you, know, you know, whether it was like clinical work or research. So the startup was a potential sixth or seventh priority down the timeline. So every healthcare company I've did uh, I've done ironically, ironically has been with a non-clinical person. So I th I think just that commitment um, and and through flexibility or uh, you know even things like I mean you know can we rethink the concept of academia today? A researcher gets awarded with a PhD, but could in the future be they're they're awarded with real world impact and the recognition to have done a startup that uplifts millions of lives, improves their health. So just that kind of translating into commitment to that ride would be something I'd be looking forward to. Would you, would you want the institution to be a co-committer? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if we think about why universities were built historically, they were for the benefit of society. And today the incentive structure is like, sure, that's happening, but quite indirectly because it's going to research and papers that's not really translating to real-world impact. So why not go back to the old definition of universities to create impact to society and the university committing to, so as opposed to just the quantified output of financial returns and branding and a university being associated with the next cochlear or Wi-Fi, but actually that commitment to society that you know we're going and improving the lives of billions of people. So that commitment from the university, I think, would be quite profound. Michelle. Here comes the microphone. Thank you. Um, I mean, I hear about grants and seed funding and all of that for, you know, innovation to promote that sort of thing. I mean, that promotes projects and ideas, but what about promoting people? So could you have an innovation fellowship and you, you know, you come, someone comes with a great idea and they become, so it's not like then they have to go away and then come back. Part of the fellowship is going away and coming back and that's all embedded and that those people are supported. I mean, it'd be great if the NHMRC had that kind of pathway for fellows as well. So it becomes a whole, so I, I think the NHMRC and the universities do well on trying to promote impact, but it's the innovation and the startup side that hasn't quite 
got there yet? Which, I mean, it's not really a question, it's just a comment, but your thoughts around that? The, um, the industry placement within the PhDs is a starting point to that because it's almost then, I think the difference is making it more like the usual so that part of what we do is scientific writing and experiments and the other parts of what we do are working for social for impact in the community. So the in I think a fellowship would be a neat idea, but it would also be a neat idea to have it embedded <laughs> in roles that were like, so it became more like part of the culture of what ev everyone innovates. I think I think that's that's a really important point to make that it's it's not an optional extra. It should actually be what we do all the time. And on that note, just to answer your question, um, we are actually starting down that journey of working with industry to create um, regular internships where industry partners come into the university to see what we do and university people going there. But even that whole concept of innovation fellowships, you know, one or two years taken out of innovation funding that we have is under current conversation. Uh, so, so it's definitely something that we need to think about. Those are the sorts of things. Better in a way, part time better because it becomes part of what you're doing as a usual thing rather than I'm taking time out to innovate. Yep. 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 Lauren, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say um, I've actually just been very lucky to get a couple of scholarships through the um, so it's National Government Industry PhD program. And so um, we're working with a couple of industry partners and it's I'm really excited about the programs actually. One of my students started last Friday and one starts in a few weeks. Um, but it's about identifying industry relevant projects and then having obviously myself and my other academic colleagues with that you know, academic training and then they're working on an industry project. So I'm really excited about seeing how that works. It's um, going to be interesting. Buzz, did you? Yeah, going to Michelle's point, I think I think actually we, we briefly spoke about this a few weeks ago, but this idea that we we encourage PhDs to commercialise their PhD. So this, this it might be that you know, in year two they take an innovation fellowship year and we put them through a training module. So less about being involved in industry per se, but this idea that, okay, let's, let's, let's commercialise this PhD. Tell me how you're going to, to your point as well, how we're going to deliver impact, real world impact from your PhD. What does that look like from a commercial perspective, an innovation perspective? And that's a kind of really interesting model, I think, because then you're, it's, it's part and parcel of a PhD. Innovation becomes part and parcel of that PhD or a postdoc or whatever it may be. Yeah. Any other questions? Sorry, yes, please. Yeah. Take up some um, In terms of incentive, and um, I'm really struck by what you say about asking what the patient needs, what people need, what the world needs. And um, I think a lot of academics, of course, they're, they're um, incentivized by survival to continue to do their amazing work, but also values and wanting to make an impact. And what about, um, you know, you spoke about the aged care sector. And there's lots of lots of problems there, lots of needs that need to be addressed. Is it about university partnering with aged care organisations and saying, we're going to put our students in this place and we're going to learn about what are the gaps here and then we're going to come up with the solutions, you know, rather than we've got this great project and then we're going to look for how you can need it. Um, we're going to f we're going to look for need actively, and then we're going to find the solutions with our multidisciplinary teams across the board. Yeah, I think those that brings a, a really new dimension to the whole concept of incubator, where you co-design with with where the, the source of the perceived problem is, versus researchers working necessarily just with industry on the perceived response. So you know the whole concept of incubation, working with the community's need, wherever that sector is, in, in, as part of the co-designed response is, is definitely uh, something that, that's becoming much more important. Aliba, do you have any comment about that? No, but, well, only that I think it's actually a, a very different way of thinking about things. There, we do have Bullmark initiatives and where the university, for example, puts together large interdisciplinary groups to solve very clear problems like you know environmental sustainability something things like that that everybody agrees uncontroversially are clear problems um but i understand what you're saying is is a much sort of a level down and where you could not just have a general topic but actually go in and say right what is the need and i think 
that would be a really interesting um, way of going because it does then allow sort of what are the best what are the best ideas where the pe the people's passion I think a real strength of academics not that there aren't strengths of all different disciplines but it's a hard life the PhD in academic life and it normally brings in people with real passion and interest in what they do so to not take advantage of that you know so to provide people opportunities or problem spaces and try and draw in the people with the the real passion or ideas or you know inspiration to solve I think that would be really in interesting to to pick some sort of clear cohorts that works on a much smaller scale at the moment you know where single groups are working with a very clear single industry partner but sector-based embedding I'm not aware of that mm. happening I think it would be interesting Kim? like I kind of think it depends it's a disciplinary difference so I kind of think we do do that because for me, any clinician working in a hospital and the university is doing that, right? They're on the ground, they're observing where the problems are, where the needs are, they're thinking about what they're seeing. Then it's very easy to engage in co-design and thinking thinking about how things might be done differently or more effectively. So then it comes down to definition of innovation. I kind of view, I have a pretty broad definition. So different models and ways of working would be innovation for me. So I think there's across the whole medical faculty, there'd be heaps of <laughs> people working in hospitals, right, which are really big incubators for those kinds of thinking. But I'd like our definition of innovation to be big enough to bring all of that in, into mm. the definition. Yep. There's um, a, a really great example too with the, bi the biodesign program that runs through engineering. And so they basically get an engineer, uh, someone from I think usually an MBA student as well, and they go into the hospital system and then they, yeah, exactly, shadow doctors, they walk around, they see some of the issues. And there's been some brilliant innovations that have come out from that. Some of them, actually, some of the startup companies are within Melbourne Connect now. Uh, and I think that's a great way of doing it because you're putting together a group of people that are like-minded but very diverse skill sets and then letting them find a problem. I think one of, speaking of someone who spends some part of his time in, in hospitals, hospitals are a great ecosystem thinking about what you're saying, about where the problem is. But one of the big problems about the problem is as a hospital person, we tend to try and resolve the problem on our own. And we lack the confidence to go out and say, you know, just imagine if we got uh, uh, someone who's into organisational research to come and tell us why there are barriers and why people won't adopt change, for example. Or let's work with engineers because this may be a problem of how you connect and there's a way of thinking in engineering to resolve issues, for example. And that's not generally seen as a way forward. But instead we might say, let's get the surgeons and the nurses and the lab scientists together and we'll from within the hospital and, and and perhaps that's one reason why we do make progress but the progress is in short steps and maybe not as of a great leap and impactful way as we'd like. What, time for one more question. Yes, please. So how do you, um, this is probably more a question for Kim, but um, how are you seeing the policy makers treat things like personalised medical devices through that funding uh, models? And then also a second part to that around how are they weighing up the non-patient benefits like the reduction in uh, surgery times, the, the reduction in, uh, in hospital um, recovery, and then also the potential reduction in uh, patient recovery at home times and the potential impact that has on uh, the GDP as well. I think um, some of the personalised medicine has definitely challenged the policymakers and um, so they're having to think, a, you know, a bit of disruption about how they think about tackling some of those technologies, particularly where they're used to dealing with a technology that it affects a tightly defined patient group one at a time. And there's some of those technologies coming along where they impact multiple groups of patients through one technology. So it has challenged them. I think they, they're getting there. Um, they're quite good at anything that can be monetized as a cost. They're quite good at they're very good at um, capturing that within their decision, but these non-patient benefits, we're getting there. We see that um, we see it listed more within regulatory frameworks at the fourth hurdle now, the non-patient benefits. But um, 
formally bringing it into the decision making is still a little bit qualitative at the moment. But I think it'll be a big movement for the next decade is how we see non-patient benefits um, and the evolution of how we treat personalised medicine in policy making. Thanks. Thank you. So unless there is there are any more questions, it's about time to maybe share a drink with our panel. We, uh, b and before I ask you to join me in thanking them, can I just say that as a group, um, Innovation Enterprise team and the people involved with this have a real clear belief that everyone in health, in health research, in healthcare is a natural innovator. They see a problem, they apply a treatment, they look at the outcome. They decide whether they're happy or not with it and they come back the next time with a new solution that is better. So we're all naturally placed to be innovators and that's why we believe as a group that innovation is not optional. For our line of work it should be mandatory in fact. And the 21st century is a new way of thinking. It is not the 20th century on steroids. We have to think differently, we have to act differently, we have to use different resources and today I think you've heard from the crew how we, we have so many opportunities and perhaps the most poignant thing is to look just be beyond our circle to create the Venn diagram with another circle because that is the only way that as a u university and as a university community we perhaps are going to make the biggest impact. So please join me in thanking the panel for an excellent conversation. We, we, have, um, we have spared no expense for afternoon tea. Please join us in uh, chatting with each other as well as networking with our panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>